Bedlam was a butt kicking. The Sooners seem to be hitting their stride. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, breaking down Oklahoma football. We got uh, Jason Ray on the line as usual from Last Word on College Football. Jason, how are we doing today? Doing good, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. We would uh, like to remind everyone to hit that like button. Subscribe here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Hit that bell for the notifications. That way you know when we're going live, which is every day. Well, Oklahoma State, over the course of the season, even though the Sooners have been trending up, if you look at the entire resume, Oklahoma State appeared to be the best team in the Big 12 and the most balanced team and playing the best football. If you look at, again, their consistency throughout the season, the one loss to Texas, they dominated on the stat sheet. I saw just about every play of that game. But then you put them on the same field with the Sooners who are surging. And my goodness, it was, uh, like I said, a butt kicking. Yeah, Mark, it was very interesting. You know, as you talked about Oklahoma, that they've been surging and it was very evident. You know, I think one of the questions kind of coming in is they've been surging against TCU. They were surging against Texas Tech, surging against Kansas. What will that what would that look like once they um, play the team that, you know, coming in was to your point was probably the best team um, overall in, in the Big 12. And I think just the way that game started on both sides of the ball was really evident that you know that Oklahoma is definitely getting a lot better um you know it really reminded you of you know the the teams over the last you know four or five years that have won um those big 12 uh big 12 titles and I think just for me coming coming away from the game the biggest the biggest I guess thing that I would take away from it, it and, and you know the offense is there. It's always it's always been there. You know, under Lincoln Riley, it will get better. And you saw really kind of the maturation of Spencer Rattler from the beginning of the year to how he was um, how he was Saturday night. But I think the biggest takeaway is really just how big, how physical, and and how much improved the defense is. I mean, you saw from the beginning of the game how big of a difference Ronnie Perkins um, watching that game makes on the dif- on the defensive line. I think. It's been a long time since, since since you've seen an individual dominate a football game um, at the line of scrimmage on the defensive side of the ball for Oklahoma, like Perkins did um, early and often. He was, um, he, you know, he was probably a little bit of an intimidating factor for, you know, Oklahoma State. And I know there was a lot of, you know, in the typical rivalry game, you'll see a lot of um, talking back and forth. And Oklahoma certainly did a lot of that on the. Um, specifically on the defensive side of the ball, but how aggressive they were, how well they tackled, um, how much you know they were able to get pressure in, in Sanders' face throughout the game was really, um, really impressive. And I think locally, there's Grinch. Even though it was second his second year, he was getting a lot of pressure early on in the year. Just how bad they played, particularly against Kansas State. And so I think certainly the the opposite is is holding true now. You know, just talking about how good they are playing, um, really on all in all facets of the game on the defensive side of the ball. Ronnie Perkins with two sacks and three tackles for loss, and uh, just got back in the lineup a few weeks ago for the Sooners. When you look at the offense, these two are most definitely working hand in hand. Yeah. Spencer Radler had to throw the ball a lot the first few games of the season. The running game was only accounting for about three and a half yards per carry through the first three to four games. Mm-hmm. So a lot of pressures put on the redshirt freshman quarterback. Right. He plays well, but when you're throwing the ball 40, 45 times, he's going to make the two or three costly mistakes. And he did. Now he's throwing the ball more like in this game, 17 of 24, right. because the running game is playing better. We know that uh, Oklahoma has fielded arguably the best offensive line in the country for several years. Well, the offensive line took a step back with all the uh, the losses, personnel losses coming into this season. Well, they're obviously getting better and forming better back into an Oklahoma type and caliber offensive line. And therefore, the running game has improved. Pressure off Rattler. He makes less mistakes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's it's certainly you're seeing more of a complimentary team. I think Herbstreit even talked about that a little bit on the broadcast. I don't know that I would necessarily go as far as he did, but he said – he thought this was the most com- this this team this year was a more complete team than any of the teams that they've had over the last few years, which is interesting. But you can still understand why he said that, um, just in terms of the defense being complementary of the offense. And I think to your point, Mark, um, 
obviously having Ramondre Stevenson back there, um, who is a you know he he was a big physical back and really more of the kind of the Oklahoma prototypical back that you that you have in, in terms of his talent, his his ability to um, not be tackled by the first guy, and you know he. You know, the, the running game surprisingly a little bit struggled in the first half. Um, I think they only had about 30 yards in the first half. And, of course, they Ramondre Stevenson had about 140-some yards total. Um, so they that, so they kind of got Oklahoma State a little bit more, um, gashed them a little bit more later in the game. But I think y- your point's well taken. You know, over the last few games, they've, they've ran the ball extremely well. Um, offensive line is gelling, getting a little bit better. As well as you would expect uh, this time of the year, especially with with five guys that have a decent amount of playing time from last year. Um, but yeah, I think the it, the most interesting thing, and for the first time, really in in a long time, you're seeing a more complete, more um, you know, complementary team, um, you know, in all facets of the game this year. Talking Oklahoma football here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Our mission is to provide the best in discussion, debate, and analysis every day. We got Jason Ray on the line. Please join him, Tony Syracusa, Kevin McGuffey, the rest of the staff there at Last Word on College Football to get you set for another big weekend in college football as we head toward Thanksgiving, the end of November. And then, of course, with the schedule revisions because of COVID, we're diving deep into December before we're going to figure out all that is uh, the college football playoff race and otherwise. And we'll get to the Big 12 race in just a second. This West Virginia team has rebounded uh, quite nicely in Neil Brown's second season after a 4-8 and eight campaign last year. 5-3. and three. Um, Our last look at West Virginia as a contending team was, of course, with Will Greer throwing the ball all over the place in that, am I going to get the score right, like 59-56 game or whatever it was against yeah. Oklahoma for a spot in the Big 12 championship right. game just a few yeah. years ago, but that's not West Virginia now uh, necessarily. Uh, we're looking at uh, a, a defense that is playing extremely well. Yeah, no, they they are. it's eerily similar to um, to Oklahoma State last, last week. So I think maybe that gives Oklahoma a little bit of a – um, maybe not an advantage, but from a prepar- preparatory perspective, um, they're they're very similar. So on the offensive side, they have Jared Dagey, um, who's been who's been pretty serviceable for West Virginia this year. Um, Thirteen touchdowns, three interceptions. I think he's completed about 66 percent of his his passes. You know they they don't ask him to do a lot because they really um, you know they really get behind the running game and, and Letty Brown. I think he's the second leading rusher um, on the. In, in the Big 12 behind Brees Hall at, at Iowa State, um, just in terms of his product, productivity, and, and they really rely on him. They have, you know, they have a backup running back, Alex Sinkfield, that, you know, spells him from time to time, but he's, you know, he's really, the, he's really the guy. Um, so he's, he's the main guy from, and from a passing perspective, they really, you know, they really look at the, at the short intermediate route. They don't have a lot of game changers really from a deep threat perspective, but, um, they, they, they do rely on that running game, quick, you know, ball control type of offense. And then, as you mentioned on the defensive side, um, they're fifth in the country, fourth or fifth in the country in passing yards allowed less than 200 yards a game. Um, they've got 10 interceptions, which leads the big 12 in that category. And then, you know, from a total defense perspective, I think they're fourth in the country, um, as well. So this will be another really good challenge for Oklahoma, um, specifically on the offensive side, look, you know, it's a little bit different. I know the, you know, the crowds and the, um, you know, the atmosphere is a little bit different than obviously what it would be in a normal season. But, you know, it, it's one thing playing a team like Oklahoma State, you know, it's your rival, you know, you're going to be amped up at home. Now you have to go back and do that two day, two games in a row against a team that's very similar. You know, like I said, the crowd won't be a huge factor, but it's, it's a night game. It is at West Virginia. They'll be, you know, they'll be ready. They're undefeated at home this year. Um, you know, they haven't they haven't had a great um, home schedule. Um, in turn, Baylor might have been their best team, uh, the best team that they've beaten at home this year. But you know, still undefeated. They they don't make a whole lot of mistakes. So I think Oklahoma is going to have to. Um, have a similar type output, um, you know, enable for them to kind of get over it, get over this to get, you know, to put themselves in position to get back to the Big 12, um, you know, the, the Big 12 championship game. The one, I think the one good thing that you would see from Oklahoma is the possibility of them getting a couple of guys back that they were missed, that, that missed this past week against um, Oklahoma State. Austin Stogner had a 
a knee contusion that he got injured in the game, um, in the uh, Kansas game before the bye week. So he was out, second leading receiver on the team um, behind Marvin Mims so far this year. If they're able to get him back, that's a little bit of a safety blanket that Rattlers used. I mean, it really wasn't impactful, um, incredibly impactful against Oklahoma State, but, you know, that's another option that that he would have. Um, then there's a couple of defenders, um, a couple of secondary players, their starter, uh, one of the starters, Jaden Davis, one of the cornerbacks, getting him back, that would be that that could be helpful, um, really from a depth perspective. But um, yeah, I think it's it's like I said, it's it's very interesting that the, the those teams are um, eerily similar. Um, you know, West Virginia might be a little bit better on offense. Um, Daggy has been more consistent throughout the year. Um, you know, Letty Brown is is probably about on the same level that you would see kind of a, a Ch Ch Chuba Hubbard and an LD Brown from Oklahoma State kind of combined into one, if you would. Um, but yeah, just a big challenge, I think, coming back and being able to bring that same um, that same ability, that same play, um, that same um, you, you know, just being ready to play this week um, to, to bring it two weeks in a row. West Virginia, the last three weeks against Kansas State, Texas, and TCU have given up. 10, 17, and six points. Those are not Big 12 scores. But then again, as we talked about last time, if everybody looked at the, the Big 12 scoring uh, versus the other conferences, they wouldn't see, I'm going to say, any difference. Well, it's kind of interesting that you you mentioned that. So when when I put together an article for Last Word on College Football, you know, previewing the Oklahoma and Oklahoma State game, I went I went through and did, did a, a comparison of the scores um, between the the Big 12 and the SEC, and, and the total score on an average was really like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 difference. Oh, the Big 12 is still slightly above, but it's you know I think they've changed the you know they've changed the discussion you know. And if you look at that game, I mean anyone that looked at it, um, that Oklahoma Oklahoma State game, you know from a holistic perspective, you can tell on both sides of the ball, certainly on Oklahoma, but Oklahoma State as well, you know that these teams are improved. It's not just a you know, it's not just an outscore you each game. You know, the the, the defensive um, play has certainly improved in this conference. Absolutely. Got uh, Jason Ray on the line from Last Word on College Football to talk Oklahoma. They go on the road to Morgantown to take on the Mountaineers. All right. So Oklahoma State's loss pretty much ends the chances of the Big 12 being represented in the college football playoff. But what it does is it makes for a very interesting Big 12 conference championship race to get to those top two slots. My goodness, I'm looking at it right now. Jason, I see that Iowa State's in great shape at 6-1. and one. And then we've got a litany of teams with two losses, meaning three of them basically with Oklahoma, Texas, and Oklahoma State. Iowa State and Texas play a huge game this Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's start there and and just give us your rundown of how this shakes out and how things could be determined based on head-to-head -head or three-way tie breakers. Yeah, there's a, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of scenarios that I think it could unfold. So I think, you know, first and foremost, you know, from the Oklahoma perspective, you, you have to, you have to assume Oklahoma, you know, runs the table. If they don't run the table, obviously they're, they're on the outside looking in, but the way it kind of looks, if Iowa State is able to beat Texas and then they go on and win that final game, it will be Oklahoma and Iowa State in the Big 12 championship game. Now, if Texas, which at, at one point in the year, they were pretty much counted out. Now, if they're able to beat um, if they're able to beat Iowa State and they run the table, which is it, it's not um, not guaranteed, they still go to Kansas State, um, they will and then they have the makeup game against Kansas on December 12th, um, they will be the representative against Oklahoma. So I think for, for all intents and purposes, Oklahoma is in if they win out with the exception of if Kansas State finishes fourth because Oklahoma has that loss um, against Kansas State because so so when you look at a tiebreaker perspective, if you have three you know if you have three teams, whether it's Oklahoma, Texas and Iowa State, you know, Oklahoma, Texas, and Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, Iowa State, and um, Oklahoma State, you know, I think conventional wisdom says, you know, a lot of those three teams, they'll have the head-to-head -head record. A lot of them will be one and one against each other, especially if you look at, you know, Oklahoma, Iowa State, and Texas. If Texas is able to beat Iowa State, and let's say they lose 
um, to Kansas State. So if Kansas, it, the way the tiebreaker rules go, then it would be your head-to-head against that fourth-place team. Well, if Kansas State finishes fourth via that head-to-head loss um, that Oklahoma had, Oklahoma wouldn't um, – wouldn't be able to make it to the championship game because of that. So I think if you're an Oklahoma fan, you either want to root for Iowa State to, you know, win their next two games, root for Texas to win their next two games. If not, you don't want to see Kansas State win one of their next two games, which, I mean, I think the way the team, the way the teams are playing right now, um, you know, Kansas State is really kind of a shell of what they were earlier in the year. They've They've not. They've lost three in a row. They just they got annihilated at Iowa State on Saturday. So they have. They go to Baylor this week, um, which won't be an easy game. And then they obviously they host Texas to to finish out the season. So you know I think you know things are probably looking you know it, you know looking in Oklahoma's favor um, just in terms of the way the teams are playing late um, late down the stretch. But like I said, you. I mean, it, it's really. I think it would be really difficult for Oklahoma fans to actually root for Texas to win at you know anything, um, but especially now. But if if Texas is able to beat Iowa State on on Friday, which is going to be, I mean, to your point, like a really, I mean, it's going to be a gigantic game. Um, both teams are in the t- top 25, 11 a.m. kickoff on Friday. Um, Iowa State's playing great football right now. Um, you know, Texas is playing better. They're not probably at the level that they need to be, but they are playing playing better, and they've put themselves in position to um, to get an opportunity to come back to the um, to the Big Twelve championship game. So, as long as Oklahoma wins out, I think you know they've got a pretty good chance of kind of getting back there. So, to clarify this, and I want to be correct, of course, Iowa State, Texas, and Oklahoma control their own destinies. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yep. Okay. So then the Texas, and it may not turn out to be that simple because, of course, the Texas, the Texas Iowa State winner could go lose another game. But right. just to be, uh, take the simplified approach, yeah, the Texas Iowa State game controls its own destiny as well as Oklahoma. And Oklahoma State, after being in control until last week, is on the outside looking in. Despite a four and two record in conference, they need a whole lot of help. They do, yeah. There's, I mean, there's, there's a path for them to. Um, I don't, th- I don't know if they know that we have enough time to actually go through what that path looks like, but there is a path that they could actually get back to the Big Twelve um, championship game should they, um, should they win out. But um, yeah, I mean, to your point exactly. If Iowa State runs the table, they have their control, their own destiny. Texas and, and to a certain extent, Oklahoma as well. I've also concluded that Kansas does not have a path. Unfortunately for the Jayhawks, they do not um, have a path. Good stuff. Jason Ray, last word on college football, breaking down Oklahoma for us uh, just about every week here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Head on over to last word on college football to get your set for a huge Thanksgiving weekend in college football. Jason, we appreciate it. 